Yo, what is up? I'm Jack Rowland and welcome to In Too Deep. Today I am joined by artist, jeweler and taxidermist Julia DeVille. Julia's work is absolutely breathtaking. Her use of taxidermied animals, often partially encrusted with precious stones and presented on expensive silverware, are both beautiful and eerie. They challenge our disregard for and consumption of wild and domestic animals, as well as honouring their life by immortalising their beauty. Dozens of baby chickens in an ice cream vat, mice with diamonds for eyes and silver tails, and even an entire preserved giraffe are all examples of her ambitious practice. Backed up with an incredible resume, exhibiting worldwide and acquisitions at National Gallery of Victoria and Mona Tasmania, just to name a few. I really love this chat with Julia, and I hope you guys do too. All right, let's get deep with Julia DeVille. Is there a point to all this? I think we're getting in too deep. You don't apply. Bad luck. Well, I have one speed, I have one gear. Go, 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 Go. I'll tell you when we're getting into deep, 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 deep. Julia Deville, thank you so much for joining me. It's uh, such a such an honor to meet you. I've been such a huge fan of your work for eight like years. It's um yeah, your work is just so amazing and unique, and just um yeah, thank you for thank you for doing this. Appreciate it. No, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. No, not at all. Um yeah, I've wanted to meet you for a while because I, I feel like um. I think we've uh, almost nearly crossed paths a few times. When I went to uh, Ramdas like years ago, I was speaking to my friend Marie, who said that you went. I think, I think we yeah, just yeah. before. So, yeah, I was, yeah, like, I was actually speaking to Marie just recently, actually. Oh, nice one. Yeah, I can't find her. She's not on Facebook anymore. But um, she's um, moved back to Canada. Yeah, yeah, I knew that. Yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. please say hi next time you speak to her. Yeah. I will. <laughs> um yeah first time I think I saw your work was probably like oh, almost like eight or nine years ago probably now I think it was in Sophie Gannon gallery and I hadn't actually heard of you at that point and I kind of walked in and uh there's quite a few of your works but I think the main one I was quite a while ago now I can't remember if it was a deer or a calf but like it was suspended from the ceiling um I think from a leg a calf, yeah. yeah, and it had um again. Sorry, if I'm getting it wrong. It was either from the mouth or from the neck, but a, a string of kind of red, um, like ruby jewels or, or something that was like looked like pearls. blood. Pearls. Yeah, pearls coming from the neck, but it was dripping into. I had an antique milk bottle that was full of garnet, so it was kind of pearls representing milk and the garnets representing blood. Right. I mean, it's it's like your your work is. It's so amazing when you kind of see work that just, it's just something that no one else, you, you just don't see it very often. It, it just commands so much, um, I don't know, attention, presence. It's, it's like commands a lot of presence, your work. So you, you just can't help but walk in and just be like, you know, jaw, jaw dropped and just like absolutely just uh, immersed in your work. It's, it's, it's like beautiful uh can be kind of confronting um but yeah definitely definitely um left quite the impact on me when I saw it thank you yeah, yeah that was actually that show was my first kind of diving off into more risky waters I guess like I'd always done pieces that had subtle themes mm -hmm. but that show was like much more visceral and in your face right oh and what way was it kind of risky waters Oh, well, just like I guess everything had always been very beautiful um, and but this one, you know, like you were saying, like the the wound in the neck and um, there were lots of pieces that had, there was a piece that had a wound in the neck that had rubies like pouring out and, yeah, it was, it was more kind of food themed, so making the audience identify with the relationship with eating animals in a, in a more obvious way. Mm, right right yeah because I think a lot of your works are you know animals served on beautiful like silver dishes and uh, plates kind of presented almost like food which is um uh yeah I mean such a jarring way to actually think about your food which no one ever really does yeah yeah well it's you know like lamb comes in a polystyrene tray with glad wrap over the top mm -hmm. and presented in that way is yeah is definitely a lot more confronting yeah yeah absolutely um Sorry to ask all these like questions that I'm sure you're just tired of getting um, asked in almost every single interview. But <laughs> um, so when uh, I was wondering, like, kind of when when did you 
you know, taxidermy is such a unique um, practice, I guess. I mean, I know it's like it's a, it's a thing, but um, you, it's not seen that often in kind of the art world. Um, I often wonder when people have such specific practices, like what was – were you a creative child? Did you ha- kind of have um, a, an urge for creativity before – you acquired this, these really specific skills? Yeah, from as early as I can remember, I always made things and painted and drew. And I was actually talking to my mum the other day because I was joking about how they, my parents let me do life drawing classes when I was about nine mm-hmm. and like an adult class. But I've been going to art classes, like kids' art classes at this art school and somehow got wind of the fact that there was like a life drawing class that went on at night. And I was like, I want to do that. Yeah. And mum didn't know what life drawing was. And then when she found out, she was like, yeah, she spoke to the teacher and I think the teacher had kind of seen that I was up to it. And so they let me into the adult class and I loved it. Like, you know, seeing naked body- bodies wasn't an issue for me and I really liked the human form. So, yeah, I've always been into being creative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally relate to that with the life life drawing classes I, I got into it pretty early too uh not not quite nine but definitely like uh, I can't remember but in my teens and um yeah I don't know it, I feel like it kind of like it did change the way at a very young age how I like view the naked body sometimes it's just it's just very matter of fact about it all you know it's not um yeah, yeah. and it's so, something about that that kind of <laughs> it felt very exclusive very like um yeah. yeah very intimate setting to be working like that um, of course, there's a trust with the with the um, with the model and stuff, but yeah, it, it really uh, it was a big part of my kind of how much I love drawing as well. And just learning as well about all the different types of bodies, mm. you know, like it was just amazing the variation and yeah, yeah. So did you did you study art? So I did um, when I finished high school. I, well, I studied art throughout school, but mm-hmm. didn't really get particularly good marks because it's so hard. To, like my parents actually moved me. I went to a private girls' school, and in my final year, because private girls' schools are interested in getting good grades, they wouldn't let you do more than two art subjects, I think, because it's so much harder. And I was really good at maths and science, so they wanted me to be doing all of those sort of things. And um, so luckily my parents have been supportive and they pulled me out of that school and put me into a different school where I could do as many art subjects as I wanted. So I just did physics, chemistry, and then painting, design, photography, and one other art, which I can't remember now. Um, and then when I finished high school, I did a year of fashion school. I thought I wanted to be a fashion designer and I hated it. It was mm-hmm. just like, and I think it, I'm very into like I like to be able to do something straight away and I could just see how long it would be before I could actually make garments that I wanted to wear. And um, I just found the environment wasn't inspiring. Um, So then I moved to Melbourne to do shoe design and a similar experience. I I just realised it was going to be years and years before I would make any shoes I wanted to wear. And um, so I tried a few short jewellery courses and then the first day of the first short course I knew that I wanted to be a jeweler and at the same time I'd finally found a taxidermy teacher um which I'd been looking for since I was 16 so Hmm. yeah never I've never done um like proper art school but I've done yeah creative yeah 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 so it was was that kind of um you found the taxidermy teacher around the same same time as jewelry but was it was so I guess that was kind of I mean, did did that just kind of come by mistake or were you always, uh, you know, drawn to kind of, to taxidermy specifically? Was that kind of a deep, a deeper no, thing for you? A deep connection. So I used to have my grandmother's fox fur stole and it was like this creepy little thing where the mouth would open up and bite onto the tail. Mm. And I used to, like for Halloween, I would dress up as a fox and have it like stuck on my head. And I kind of had this feeling that, you know, when I wasn't looking that they would come to life and... I was always interested in the more macabre things from a very, very young age. And um, then when I was 16, I found an eight-pointer stag's head in an antique shop for $150 and bought it and had it on my wall and 
that was kind of, I, you know, I'd seen taxidermy before, but that was when the penny dropped that it was actually something you could learn. And I started looking for somebody to teach me, but it's a very male-dominated industry and they're generally quite grumpy men <laughs> and it didn't really take me too seriously. And it wasn't until I, yeah, until I moved to Melbourne and I'd been here for a year or two that I met these guys, Heather and Igor, that owned a shop called Wunderkammer, and they introduced me to their friend's dad, Rudy, who was a taxidermist, and he he taught me. Yeah. Wow. Are, are there many out there, like, in, in I guess, in Melbourne? Like, is, is it a quite a... Um... There's a few. They're all kind of involved in big game and stuff like that, so not so aligned with the stuff that I do. And now there's a right. lot more females like who are, you know, who are doing it as an art form, who are, who are slowly coming, coming up. So yeah, it's, it's a changing, I think people have seen now that it, it's something that doesn't have to involve killing and hunting mm. and, and stuff like that. Whereas when I first started doing it, it was a conversation stopper. Like I remember yeah. telling people that I was learning taxidermy and they would literally like turn around and walk away. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now it's cool. You know, now it's like in every bar, and there's lots of artists working with it. Yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, it's definitely changing. Um, uh, I've seen like a lot of kind of um short courses and things. People on their Instagram stories, kind of get getting in involved with it. I guess as the perceptions yeah. really changed, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and I think it's just that awareness that you can buy a secondhand piece of taxidermy. Yeah, yeah. it's. You know, like the thing that I always say when people get upset is it's like you have a cow wrapped around your foot like mm, that yeah. is taxidermy taxidermy means a ranging of skin and you have <laughs> cows wrapped around your feet so yeah, yeah there's not really much of an argument that comes back to that yeah i mean i guess like with um a lot of your work is kind of pointing out um the kind of contradictions, I guess, of how people view animals and meat and stuff. Um, you know, certain animals are totally fine to kill factory farm, but, you know, there's huge protests about, like, is it, like, in Korea how they, like, you know, will eat dog or something? Yeah. Um, and that's just, like, the most inhumane thing ever. But, I mean, really, what's the difference? I mean, yeah, if you think... It's equally if not more intelligent than a dog mm -hmm. right 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 um i was wondering um i was just really curious about the actual kind of nitty gritty of of taxidermy are you are you able to kind of like run me through the process of like when you actually get um maybe just a smaller animal to how how you actually will present it yeah so like for a bird that's a pretty um pretty much where most people would start. You make an incision down the middle and you kind of, with a scalpel, peel back the skin. Um, and when you get to the wings, you cut the... Sorry, I should turn That's fine. <laughs> um, when you get to the wings, you can you cut the bone off at the shoulder joint. Same with the legs, you cut the bones off at the hips. Um, you peel back and then to the head and cut through the neck bone and then you'd slowly peel the skin back over the head until you get to the eyes and then you kind of need to carefully get down there and cut around the eyes but so you leave enough that can be pushed back in. Um, and then with a bird, you just take it all the way to the beak, leaving the skull attached and then you have to clean off all of the muscle from the skull remove the brain and eyes. Um, then you would clean up the bones of the wings and the legs, build a new body that's the same as the body you removed. You could do that by making a mould or like for a bird, I would just get like wooden wool and bind it into the right shape and use cotton wool to kind of bind around to replace the meat you removed from the wings and legs and then anchor wires through. Um, the wires would go into the body and then it kind of gets sewn up. Well, that's a, that's a very short mm. description of it. You would, the, the brain cavity gets filled with clay and you, then you put glass eyes in um, and you also have to make sure the skin is clean and everything as well. There's no fat right. muscle on there. 
Um, wow. But, yeah, it's actually a pretty clean process in a way. Like when I first went to learn, I was nervous because I just didn't know if I'd be able to stomach it or not. But right. it's not like there's a lot of blood and guts or anything. Like it's like it just if you're doing a small bird, it just looks like a miniature chicken's body. Yeah, yeah. So you actually – so you, you would have um... – like six pieces really you'd have the torso you would cut the wings off the legs off and the head off and then kind of put oh, it no, so, so you know you, it's hard to explain but you basically the wings and the legs are all still attached to the skin that you've right. removed and your skull and so you're basically taking the body out right. and replicating that and then you remove all of the muscle from the wing and leg bones and the skull but they're still kind of all anchored into the skin and then you put the new body back in you've got wires coming through the arm bones uh, wing bones and up through the leg bones and so that's kind of how you get stability and then those get anchored into the body so they're kind of like a stick figure like poking into Mm. the structure and then it all gets sewn up and then you would position it and you would have wires coming out of the bottom of the talons so if you had if you were perching it on say a bit of wood, you would drill holes into the wood and push those wires down and then clamp the claws around the wood. So that's how it would be anchored. So in in, uh, in the training is I is a lot of it um, kind of practically really understanding anatomy of of animals, or is it is it kind of you just kind of feel it as you go? Yeah, no, you kind of just learn the anatomy as you go. Like I was, my my um, learning was very informal and like as a mentorship. So I basically mm. found this taxidermist and I would go out to his house when I found a bird or something and we would go through it together and he would kind of do one half and show me and then I would do the other half. And when I first started doing it, I just didn't know where I was. Like I felt, you know, once you're turning something inside out, it would be so confusing. But after doing it a few times, you, you get a real sense of the anatomy and you know where everything is and where you are. Did you feel weird the first few times you were doing it? No, I loved it. Like it mm. was, yeah, like I, like I said, I was worried that I wouldn't be able to stomach it. But as soon as I started doing it, it was really beautiful and peaceful and quite meditative. And my teacher, Rudy, is a beautiful human being. So it was, you know, like I felt like I was with someone who I resonated with. He's um, he's Dutch and my family is Dutch and he's just like one of those eccentric, charismatic Dutchmen and he worked in museums most of his life and he was really, you know, he loved doing taxidermy because he loved nature and he loved animals and when I did my first fox head with him, we made it kind of panting and smiling like a like a happy dog because he said he used to have to do so many foxes for hunters and they would always want it snarling. So they felt good about killing the animal and he hated doing that. So we kind of did this as like a celebration of the fox. And That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I used to um, – collect skulls when I was a kid my uncle had a, a farm and he'd give me horse skulls and cow skulls with horns and my poor parents had this big chest of just skulls and um I kind of even like recently uh, a few years ago maybe five or six years ago got back into kind of collecting really intricate um skulls of like uh mainly birds that I'd find yeah. but um so I kind of would have like uh, yeah it was the birds I would find were always pretty decomposed, so <laughs> in a very different state to the ones you'd work with. But um, yeah, I kind of had a go of like I didn't. It didn't matter if I'd mess it up because I was just after the bones. But um, you know, peeling back the skins of these beautiful like lorikeets or or sparrows or whatever I'd find, and then oh man, that brain cavity though. There's always there's always a little nest of maggots in there, just as I kind yeah. of <laughs> the most putrid thing ever, like. <laughs> I'm not a fan of maggots at all, but no, that's no. the good thing about taxidermy is when you're working on something, it has to be fresh. So yeah. if there's maggots, it's too late. Yep, yep, yep. Um, am I wrong in assuming that it's illegal to taxidermy native animals? No, that's true. Anything native is protected. So even if you find it dead, you're not allowed to collect it and you yeah. have to have a special collector's license and only people like park rangers and stuff can have a collector's license so mm. I get a lot of people wanting to donate things to me and they're always upset when I say I can't take it I'm actually I'm not doing taxidermy at the moment I'm taking an extended break mm. uh, from it so I'm not taking 
anything domestic or otherwise at the moment. But um, yeah, I used to rely on donations when I was doing it and the amount of beautiful things I've had to turn down. Mm, yeah. But it makes sense, you know, because otherwise you could go and shoot something and say you found it dead. Yeah. And for the record, I definitely was not digging through a lorikeet's brain now that we've established those laws. Um, <laughs> you can plead ignorance, I think, yeah. if you're not professionally <laughs> doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I actually did it. I can't remember who from, but I did hear that you were taking a break from the kind of taxidermy. Was that was that more to focus on your jewellery or are you just having enough of, of or are you cum- accumulating too many bodies? <laughs> uh, so I had like... I had my biggest ever show in 2018 Mm -hmm. and I did a baby zebra, uh, three lion cubs, a baby giraffe, plus like there were 50 to 100, I think there was over 100 works in total and it was all of, I don't know if you've been to Linden, New York, Mm -hmm. but it was the whole downstairs gallery and I was just recovering from burnout from 2014 when I had a show at the NGB and the Adelaide Biennial and other eight show, smaller shows in the 12-month period. So that took me four years to recover from that. And then I did this show and that just threw me right back to square one. And mm-hmm. I'm still kind of coming out of that now. And I just... The thing with my work is every time I do a show, I up the ante and I go bigger and it becomes more expensive and more stressful and more involved. And I just don't know where, how I could take it any further without killing myself. Right. 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 Well, it's like a double-edged sword. It's the problem of being too good, Julia. You're just like in so much demand that people, people just want more and more, but uh, yeah, it's one of those things like it's um, putting on a major show is incredibly taxing it just takes so much out of out of people i mean at, at least um at least you're not only upping the ante with the kind of content of your shows but like i mean showing at ngv and things like holy shit that must have been great like a incredible um i don't know oh. just um pat on the back what am i trying to say like a validation i guess into of of of, of your of your work yeah, it was an amazing opportunity and it's that's the kind of thing is you just like I got that show off of that show, which was two thousand end of two thousand and thirteen, and then I got invited to be in the Adelaide Biennial early two thousand and fourteen. And it's like you can't say no to yeah. <laughs> to the ACFA or to the NGV um at that stage in your career and so I did them both and they both had to be different works because they overlapped. And so, yeah, yeah, both of them were my biggest exhibitions I'd ever done at the time and they were only months apart. So it was, yeah. So does it yeah. just basically get to a point where you're, um, you know, it's uh, this love that you have becomes this overwhelming kind of task that's just like, I don't know, almost para- paralysis with, with like trying to deliver or something? Yeah, well, it's like the problem for me is I can always deliver. Like the the show at Linden, I was so – I didn't want to do it. I was committed financially. I'd received quite a lot of funding to produce the show. The giraffe I'd been working on, like, pulling together for 10 years almost. Mm. So it was like this thing that I felt like I had to do, but I knew that I wasn't physically up to it. But I know that I can always push through. Like I, I can run on adrenaline and I can get it done. I can work 18 hour days, seven days a week for six oh months. God. You know, I've done it before, but it's at the sacrifice of my health and my body and my life. And so I pushed through it. And normally when I would do a show, like I would just love it. It would be pure joy. I'd be in flow state and everything about it was just wonderful but this show wasn't like I hated every minute of it I didn't want to do it it was just like I was just dragging it out but then ironically it was the best work I've ever done and Mm. because I I was at a point you know after 18 years of doing that work that I could just produce like I knew how to make it but it was really interesting because I didn't actually sell anything at that exhibition even though it was the best work I'd ever done it was like energetically I feel like people can kind of sense that. I did I did eventually, like I sold the giraffe, I sold the zebra, I've sold the lion cubs. Like it did eventually sell afterwards, but normally you sell everything at an opening or mm. well, that's when you sell most of the works and then it trickles out afterwards. So it was, um, 
yeah, it was an interesting experience and it, it sent me into like a very kind of, well, not even batch, like it was actually the NGV show and the Adelaide Biennial, Biennial show when I first experienced burnout that is what sent me into kind of that place of self-discovery and that's how I ended up going to the Ram Das. I started right. meditating the Ram Das retreat. It kind of became this journey that, out of necessity, like from out of hitting rock bottom, basically having to go within and do all that. And I'm still in that process now, you know, it's been seven years since I first experienced burnout and I feel like I'm just kind of coming to some place of really getting to know myself now. Did, did, um, did the Ramdas retreats help kind of, um, kind of deal, deal with that or, you know, did it, was it resonating with you a lot or was it kind of just a nice, spiritual holiday and then the work kind of continued it, when you got home it, it had more impact than I realized at the time so again like it's only really just starting to sink in in the last year or so but I I had a very like uh, unusual experience so I started I started meditating I'd always had some experience with meditation because I learned my mum took me to the school of philosophy when I was a teenager and so I learned to meditate then and I had an understanding of like spirituality and stuff like that but then I discovered drugs and <laughs> decided it <that> was <laughs> much easier <laughs> and kind of gave up on meditation and everything else and then you know it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I started doing yoga and you know had it would kind of dabble but didn't have a serious practice and then after I had burnout I did a mindfulness course and made a commitment to do half an hour twice a day and I did it religiously I think for over three years I didn't miss a session and wow. started getting these insights and I was meditating one day and I just had this name going in my head Richard Alpert Richard Alpert Richard Alpert and I was like, who the fuck is Richard Alpert? Really? <laughs> and I, but I just kind of ignored it because it was just this crazy voice and it just kept going. So one day I was like, okay, went and Googled who Richard Alpert was and found Ram Dass and then started like listening to a lot of his stuff. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Oh, um, shit. And then, yeah, found out he was having a retreat in Hawaii. So I went to the retreat in Hawaii and I had a very profound experience there, which I didn't, I, I think I was quite out of my body at, for most of my life actually and at the time so a lot of the stuff didn't really sink in until I really got deeper into the work but I, I had this experience with him where I wanted to go and talk to him about what had happened and so I went up and he was with his carer and I just got kind of like starstruck like I just mm -hmm. didn't know it was this very overwhelming thing and I felt like I felt like I was infringing on his space because I know like as someone who does have fans, like I know what it's like to have, it's quite isolating when you have people come up to talk to you, but then they can't talk because I'm an introvert and socially awkward myself. So I don't know how to deal with the situation. And so then I was like, Oh, now I'm doing this to somebody else. And I went on this whole spiral to the point where after the, I think, the carer diffused it by, by saying, do you want to have a photo? <laughs> and that kind of like ended the situation. And I went and um, I called my mum crying. I was really just, I was just like, I don't know why, but I feel so angry with myself. And the next day I woke up and it was gone, but it was gone to the point where like something had been released in me and I don't know if I realised at the time or if it was years later, but I feel like somehow just being in his presence, he cleared something, like he cleared some fear from me. And then we had the mala ceremony and um, it was kind of weird talking about this because I haven't spoken about any of this stuff. I am all before. ears. I'm all <laughs> ears. Bring it on. I love it. <laughs> um, so we had the mala ceremony and, I, you know, and I said to him, I feel like I've let go of a lot of fear. And he just tapped his temple and said, fear is up here and then touched his heart and said, love is in here. And then he looked me in the eyes and he said, I love you. And I just laughed. Cry. <laughs> yeah, it makes me cry too. Um, I laughed and I just said, I love you too. And it was the most honest interaction I've ever had with another human in my entire life. Like it was pure, unconditional love and 
yeah, it was this amazing thing. But then I just kind of forgot about that. I started doing a different sort of meditation practice that a teacher encouraged me to do that didn't resonate with me. And I feel like I kind of fell out of a lot of that intuition that was happening and ended up doing that exhibition in 2018. Like it all kind of, yeah, it was just in the background and then after the burnout from that exhibition I started going deeper and I started doing more work I started um, experiencing um, psychedelic Mm -hmm. ceremonies and stuff and uh, and I did started doing limbic system retraining and that experience with Ramdas was one of the things I used as um as a part of that and so yeah it's actually now that experience is more powerful now than it was you know just after it happened Hmm. wow man how um you're just describing kind of your interaction with Ramdas. like I had a, a couple of moments with him where it's like the world stops he just like locks eyes with you and the presence is kind of overwhelming actually uh it was yeah. really overwhelming like I I was kind of he just it, he pierces right into your soul, um, and I kind of oh, eyes. yeah, like his eyes were locked, and I, and it was like the world stopped. It's so weird to even say, but um, and then I could almost feel myself getting self conscious and almost like bashful or something, and then just kind of be like awkwardly, like, <laughs> and then like nah, it's like it's not ending, and then I'm like okay, like, and then you just then I just kind of became more still, and it was just I don't know, it was almost like hypnotizing in this just radiation of love it was really I felt very exposed as well not like in a bad way but it was like oh my bullshit doesn't work here no he's not impressed by my tricks (laughs) I think that's what my you know my first encounter was was just that like being completely vulnerable and not knowing how to deal with it and freaking out because I've never experienced that Hmm. before but yeah. then my second encounter in the same retreat, I only did the one retreat, was just like, it was so light. Like it was just like, I felt like, you know, when you're just on in flow or something and you feel like your true version of yourself, it was just mm. like when he said, I love you. And I just laughed and said it back and it was so natural and free and, you know, to just have that interaction with a complete stranger, it was yeah, it was powerful. I think I was the best version of myself that I've ever been um, at the ret- at the first retreat and probably like, yeah, uh, maybe six months or a number of months after. Like I actually just felt that um, it was, I can't even explain it, but I was just elated and I was just, um, just really saw what the perp I don't know more purpose to everything more love more like lightness more joy I guess um I mean I've kind of been chasing that ever since like uh our our journey kind of like seems almost a bit like reverse you kind of tried psychedelics by the sounds of things from after checking out spirituality I kind of got into spirituality from psychedelics um But I genuinely felt after my first retreat that I was able to achieve the state of like the best acid high you can ever feel, but completely naturally. I mean, I did do acid at the retreat, I will admit. (laughs) That retreat did not promote that. I didn't, it was no one that, (laughs) it was not endorsed by the retreat, but I did do it. Um, So, but it, it was just this kind of like, yeah, that feeling that I, I don't know that purity. There, there's something about psychedelics that, uh, when they don't, you know, become too challenging, you can feel like you're in this pure state of just um, presence and being, and often love and joy as well. Yeah, in that sense of oneness. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because I remember when I went, I was I wasn't say I was anti, but I definitely was classing psychedelics as drugs at that point like I and I you know I guess I'd heard him speak about how you don't need them to achieve these states mm. so I was quite dogmatic with that but I, you know I'd done a lot of psychedelics as a teenager right. just creationally so I'd had experiences like that but I was I was fruitarian at the time so I was oh, wow. very ungrounded and um you know like very anti anything that wasn't 
ultimately really pure and then it took me like once I came out of that and yeah I don't even I can't even I think it might have been Michael Pollan's book that he's great kind of op- yeah he's amazing it opened my eyes up to it again and yeah mm. did an ayahuasca ceremony in February last year and it changed my life and, really yeah care to share or is it a was it a personal uh, no, journey no no no, so I moved back to New Zealand basically. So after the show in 2018, I had a whole lot of health stuff that was going on. Uh, I sold my house, moved back to New Zealand. I, you know, I literally packed everything up and shipped it over there. And after being there for six months, started feeling really good again and had um, was just starting to feel like I was coming right. And then on New Year's Eve, I was sitting on the couch with my family watching comedy and my knee, it was actually interesting because that day I'd been listening to a Sam Harris podcast and he just mentioned something about meditation, about how, you know, it's not about all love and life and stuff. It's, you know, like at some point somebody's going to die or you're going to hurt your knee. And I felt this contraction when he said that because it's been a, I had surgery on my other knee and I had this fear of that one day I was going to do my left knee. And I felt something in my body when he said that. And that night I was sitting on the couch with my family and I went to get up and my knee was locked. And it was like stuck at a right angle. The cartilage flipped in between the bones. So I couldn't straighten it and I couldn't bend it. It was agonising. And so I had to spend weeks in bed because I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even walk on crutches. And it was New Year's Eve. So, you know, like after three visits to the emergency department where they tried to yank it straight and did all sorts of other ridiculous things, um, I basically worked out that I wasn't going to be able to get surgery done in New Zealand it would take, you know, it would be till September or something because the system there is a mess. And um, I had my surgeon who I had knee surgery with, I called as soon as they opened, which was like the 14th of January or something, and they got me in the next week. So I flew over to Melbourne and had surgery. And then just the whole start of the year had this really – was this, this was the start of last year. So, you know, it had gone kind of gone from like New Year's and we were all feeling like it was a fresh start and everything to like literally the start of my year was this knee thing. And then my mum's partner got diagnosed with cancer. My uncle had a stroke. My grandfather was in hospital. So while I was unable to walk at home, mum was at the hospital all day, every day, because these other three people were there having these really serious things. And so I was kind of fending for myself and... Then I was just like, I think I'd been thinking about doing an ayahuasca ceremony, but I was planning on doing it in like April or something. And I was like, I just have to go now. Like, I feel like there's a shitstorm happening around me and I feel like I'm somehow creating it. And so, I, yeah, in February, I flew to Melbourne and did this ceremony and was kind of going thinking like, do I shut my business down? Do I, you know, like I didn't, that was my main question. And, of course, as it always goes, you don't get the answer in the way that you think. And basically I ended up making friends with myself, which I realised was the first time I had ever actually done that. And then it was in the following week that I just had this epiphany. I was like, why did I move to New Zealand? Like the whole reason I went to New Zealand was because I wanted to spend more time with my family. But basically I was having to fly to Melbourne once a month for a week. So it would take me a week to prepare for that trip, a week for the trip. I wouldn't get to see any of my friends because I'd have so much work to do and then it would take me a week to recover and then I'd have a week of kind of working remotely where I wasn't that efficient. I was like, I could just live in Melbourne, do like three months or two months of cruisy work and then fly back to New Zealand for a month and have like a month of holiday with my family Um so I just realised I was looking at the whole thing wrong. So then I shipped everything back to Australia, my dogs, my whole house full of stuff. And in, and then this was March and COVID happened and ended up staying with friends up in Jan Juk, realising that I didn't want to live in the city anymore and ended up buying a place out in the Dandenongs and yeah, now living in the forest. Yeah. And it's, yeah, 
all of that was just from that one experience. I'd probably still, I'd probably be stuck in New Zealand. My business would have died now because I wouldn't have been able to run it from another country. And, wow. I mean, yeah. heavy time. I'm so sorry to hear about all that heaviness. And, um, man, I don't know, it seems like you, you seem to be getting a lot of those weird cosmic coincidences that kind of push you into the yeah. next um, – the next kind of phase, which is uh, really magical, it really gets me excited. Kind of hearing those those it's often yeah. tough lessons or or beautiful coincidences, synchronicities, or whatever. Yeah, well, I've just been going with it now. Like I've kind mm. of learned. At first, I just discounted it, but now I'm at the point where I've kind of decided to go with it, and I just listen to that voice now. Like it took me so long to be able to. I guess, single it out from all the other crazy voices that go on inside my head. But there's definitely this distinct voice that seems to know stuff and I'm working out how to tune into that. And whenever I do, it's always right. And yeah. Mm. The whole making friends with yourself thing, I think is like, it's such a kind of cruel joke that the universe often will kind of do to us. Like, so, I, I mean, I've been caught for... I. For, for, for periods of years of actually realizing that I don't like myself, I'm pretty good these days, but I don't know why, but like there's, there's been things that have actually just made me not like myself. Hasn't been crazy bad. I've never really suffered from like, I've gone through like depressing times, but I've never gone through like chronic depression or anything. And I, and I feel for anyone that does, I know lots, so too many people that do, but um, I, th I think at, at the root of so much of it is just this like so ma so many of us really just don't like our own company or don't like or wish we were this better version of ourselves that's often unrealistic. And look, psychology can really help and, and it does really help, but of often it can just like you can hear all the words, but it's not until some kind of like I don't, whether it be some kind of a psychedelic experience or even spiritual experience, but it has to be felt, you know, it, it often has to be this deep feeling of that kind of understanding or seeing it from outside of yourself where you're like, okay, I can see it objectively and this is harmful. But um, yeah, yeah, it's the, it's the difference between knowing something on an intellectual level and feeling right. it. And it's, um, it's actually funny because, you know, for me that started opening up with psychedelics, but are you familiar with Jessa Reed? No. I, I, so um, I've forgotten his name now, the guy that you had on recently, the comedian. Ramin? Ramin Nazar? Ramin, yeah. yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's, he's friends with her. And so she is this incredible comedian. Um, she's an ex-meth addict who had a near-death experience and then basically – became a psychic although she doesn't use that word but um and she continued even after her near-death experience to do meth for quite a while and then she just gave up one day when she when it felt right but she's kind of like my perfect flavor of spirituality because she's like funny she swears mm. she does psychedelics but the way and everything that she talks about is all of that stuff that you've learned in buddhism and in meditation class from your yoga teacher but somehow the way she delivers it it just clicks and it's kind of like yeah there's just you know things like being aware of your thoughts or all of those things that you know that you should do, but it seems like this really elusive thing that's impossible. And somehow the way she explains it has just, yeah, it's kind of clipped in. And mm. I feel like that stuff, I'm kind of catching up to all of those concepts now in, in like an experiential way. Right. I'm so grateful for all these like um, kind of comedians that have, uh, uh, started leading the way in spirituality, just making it all so much more digestible and palatable for uh, uh, people who may not have thought it was like for them. Like Duncan Trussell, just like the best. Yeah. Pete Holmes, another one. Um, uh, yeah, Ramin. It's um, yeah. I'm just it's, amazed it's how many there are. Like it's yeah. Because Jessa has it. Like that's how I heard Ramin. Like Jessa has all of these different comedians who are like spiritual in all different ways like some of them are tarot readers i don't know if you've heard of um paranormal karen no like she's a paranormal investigator and a tarot reader but also a stand-up comedian like, <laughs> that's so good amount of 
these people out there. Yeah, I just listened to uh, Ramin's latest podcast uh, with um, – uh, with a tarot yeah. reader and he got a reading during during the thing because tarot has always been a bit um a bit out there for me but it's so funny because the one time I did get a tarot reading the cards were like exactly uh they were so on point but my like uh you know critical skeptical brain just like well you know it's it's an odds game. Of course, they you know, every now and then they're going to be relevant. So, like, I'm actually getting, like, the best messages, but I'm just like, ah, yeah, just still kind of disregarding it. And it's just like, I don't know, even if it if it is real or if it isn't real, if you can get the message of what you actually kind of, you allow your subconscious to take in, isn't that kind of the point? Maybe? Yeah, well, I guess that's kind of what I was joking to, mm. I think, with my mom about with, the Jess, with Jessa Reed. I was like, it's it's changed my life in a really profound way and it's either it's real or I'm mentally ill, <laughs> but I would rather swap this version of mental illness for the other one yeah. <laughs> where you're really unhappy all the time and yeah. everything is hard. So, um, but I think yeah, I listened to that episode as well and I thought it was a good point that she made that like you could read, you could do a reading of your cat's vomit, you know, like it doesn't matter right. like, Caro is just a, a a way of getting information, but you can get, you know, it's, I guess, no different to the voice in your head or anything else. Mm. Like it's, you know, when something's true or not, I think. Yeah. Um, so, we can, I mean, we're kind of talking about like, you know, mediums and, and all this other stuff. But I want to kind of go back to when you heard this voice that was just saying Richard Alpert, Richard Alpert. Had you read any of Richard Alpert or Ramdas? Or were you aware? Do you think this was something that like uh, just kind of slid into your subconscious or was it do you th- like what, what what do you think was going on there? That's like I had a, I had a oh, I'll get into it in a bit, but I had a similar kind of thing on my first acid trip where I was hearing this really uh, this voice that was actually really cheesy um, it was that Bill Hicks uh, kind of um, speech he, he does at the end of one of his um, um, stand-up comedian uh, comedy specials about the world is like a ride in an amusement park. And I'd heard it once or twice, but the whole thing was kind of like getting drilled into my head over and over as I was on the verge of an anxiety attack during like a really intense <laughs> as a trip and it calmed me down and it grounded me and I was like what the fuck was that like is my brain just like a hundred times more amazing than I ever gave it credit for or I don't know are they like I mean I guess my, my point of this is like do you think do you, do you feel like there's any um I mean how much do you subscribe to this kind of spiritual spiritual um because there's the spirituality within yourself then there's the kind of the beings or angels or spirits that might overlook people i mean how far down the kind of um new age path do you do you resonate with do you think you're being told a, a message then yeah so i feel like i was always i've always been open to that stuff because mum would like take us to crystal healers and homeopaths and your stuff parents sound cool kids. Yeah, my, like, <laughs> my dad's very eccentric and mum was always very like interested in in that sort of stuff and you know she was doing tm when i was a little girl and she she said that not obviously when i was little she didn't tell me this but she said that when she her first day of meditating she imagined that was what taking acid was like like Mm. she's and she's had out of body experiences and things like that just spontaneously so she's pretty tuned in in that sense and so i was always open to that but i was also very scientific and kind of quite deeply rooted in that world as well. And I just feel like in the last year, I'm probably erring more to the woo side just because it's like there's more kind of crazy stuff happening that I can't explain in other terms. And, you know, I think that that thing when you do psychedelics and you the veil gets lifted and you encounter other energies and entities and stuff but even after like I had a a mushroom session a few months ago and there was like maybe two weeks afterwards so much activity going on in my bedroom at night like I could feel things 
there was like little lights and stuff happening and you know like you could scientifically say that's just the psychedelic still a little bit in your brain but I just it felt like I was just perceiving more than what I normally do and um yeah I don't you know I don't know how to explain like having a voice come into your head telling mm. you something like that when I'd never come across like yeah maybe somebody maybe at some point I had but nothing that I remembered and it's not like I'd been actively looking into those sort of things um and it was really before you know that, that's kind of started me going on a bit of a YouTube tunnel when I found Richard Alpert and I think that's how I found a whole lot of different people that I follow now but um yeah I just I kind of think it's more fun to believe these things and whether they're real yeah. or not like it's harmless totally you know the universe like provided life, yeah my life has been better since deciding that so mm. yeah yeah, that's that's wonderful. That's like ah, oh, no, such an uplifting. Um, it sounds like a massive life shift for you in the last like. So this is like what since two thousand eighteen you were saying, or seventeen or something. Not so that the long Ramdas, ago. Well, no, the Ram Dust thing was two thousand and fourteen, I think. Right. Yeah. Two thousand and fifteen. Mm. But yeah, this this more recent shift was just like this year, really. Like, um, it's been. I feel like I've had a pretty dark seven years and like I'm just now probably through, I've come back to the type of meditation that I was doing when I was getting like, so I did, I did mindfulness and then I did, I put my staff through um, TM. So I did that with them. So I started doing TM and then I started doing a different meditation that my yoga teacher encouraged me to do that I really didn't resonate with. And then I kind of gave up on that and I was trying to remember what type of meditation I was doing when I had that Ramdas message and I just assumed it was the TM. So I started doing that again, but it still wasn't really resonating. And then when I had this, my last psychedelic experience, I um, had this huge epiphany that I've been like disconnected from my body for so long and that's how I've been able to push myself so hard because I haven't really been feeling the damage I've been doing and that's when I had it clicked. I was like, of course, it was the mindfulness that I was doing when I had all of that Ram Dust stuff happening because I was doing body scanning and it was bringing me back into my body, which was tuning me into my intuition. And yes, yeah, since I've been doing that again, that's when everything started really opening up. So it's kind of like I was already there seven years ago and kind of went off path. And mm. yeah, it took me seven years to come back to that. I often think about like the kind of um, the story of, Ram Dass of like, what are the, I always think like, what are the odds? Like, you know, he was a very interesting, interested kind of guy that was really good academic. What are the odds that he was one on the forefront of the psychedelic movement with Timothy Leary? And then yeah. from there, he kind of kept looking at trying to find answers. And then what are the odds that he found like his guru that has just affected so many people, like all these weird things clicked into place for this one individual, but kind of like even thinking about, um, you know, just kind of you describing it now. I mean, it seems almost um, you've been working with death for your whole adult life. You've been working with vessels and bodies, like bodies of, of animals that, um, um, you know, are without their kind of soul or spirit that, that's left. Um, you, you've clearly had some kind of like deep um, uh, attraction maybe or you're drawn to elements of, of death and and I, w I was actually wondering how much um when working with dead animal bodies constantly how much uh how much you you might contemplate dead death or even just contemplate spirituality like what what does it mean to have an empty vessel without without the spirit in it what what is your kind of understanding of of i don't know the the nature of the spirit of life itself i guess uh, well, I guess if I'm to be really honest, I almost feel like I was doing the taxidermy in some kind of talismanic way to ward off death because I was, even though I, if you'd asked me at the time, I would have said that I wasn't afraid of death. I think I was so afraid of it that I was just immersing myself in it in this weird kind of, I guess, yeah, you could see it as like witchcraft or shamanic or mm. something, but 
like from a very young age I was like mum ended up running into an old friend years ago and telling her about what I was doing and her friend was like oh that's so interesting because she remembered picking up her daughter and me from kindergarten one day and just out of the blue in the back of the car I turned to her friend and I said Emma when you die do you want to get buried or do you want to get all burned up and she was just remembered thinking that was so odd for a three-year-old to be (laughs) and I I was always like that like and then my grandmother died when I was I think, 11 or 12. And my parents being my parents, I, I was allowed to see her body and touch her and all of that. But that was actually a really big turning point for me. I loved her so much and she was this very warm, kind person. And then seeing her dead body and touching the rubbery face and it was cold and there was a sense of like that's not Alma like this is just something else and I think that's what kind of started the the interest in taxidermy and that idea of a vessel and and that sort of thing but I that really changed me like that was a very traumatic experience and my vision started like I ended up getting glasses not long after that like all of these kind of things started happening um which I kind of connect to that in a way and um yeah, I just, I feel like I was just surrounding myself. And it was funny because I haven't had anyone die since she died. And, but I have had a few weird experiences that also kind of made me feel freaked out by death. Like I, my sister for her birthday one year, my younger sister, I made a cake that looked like our dog. And so I always used to draw him. He was a little schnauzer, Jimmy. And he was at the vet because he'd been sick and we took the cake out and cut the cake and just as we cut the cake the vet called to say that the dog had died and so we had to take the cake away from my sister and we told them that we put salt in instead of sugar because we don't remember any birthday party but I like was mortified like I thought I had voodooed my dog my god death so you know then I kind of that built a lot more fear around it and feel it this feeling of responsibility and yeah I kind of I feel like I got to this point where I felt like I had to be doing it to protect like there was an element of OCD which I'd had I think it probably started after my grandmother died but I was terrified of losing my mother and um yeah it almost became like this OCD protection thing and then when I started having this sort of awakening of my view of reality and the burnout and everything I just didn't want to play with dead things anymore like it's I'm not saying that I'll never do it again but and it doesn't bother me but this yes I don't even know how to put it into words really yet but I know what it's like you played a video game and you clocked it yeah. You won the yeah. game. You got NGV. You did all these amazing things. You got the giraffe. You clocked it. You did it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it just, it just doesn't really resonate anymore. And I still like, I still get ideas and stuff. And I, I, I've been I'm doing a zebra for someone as a commission hmm. at the moment. But the idea of, yeah, of doing an exhibition. But there was kind of a fear of like, if I stop doing this, are people going to start dying? And, I just, I didn't even realize that that was there until quite recently. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Did you, do you find uh, throughout all this process of working and being, particularly like when you're working on a major show and you're surrounded with so many different kind of, uh, what's the taxidermy t- term? You wouldn't say corpse, would you? Bodies? I'd, yeah, I would just, well, they're normally animals to yeah. me that I'm yep. on, so do I normally call it animal. Yep. Do you feel any um, heavy? Do you feel heaviness from from any of that? Having having any? I mean, I don't know if you believe in ghosts or spirits after, or whether you know spirits linger around bodies or anything. But have you ever kind of felt any of of the the work that you're doing with them? Kind of anything lingering around or heaviness? It's definitely, I wouldn't say heaviness, but definitely a sense of reverence. Like for me, doing taxidermy was always this very kind of peaceful thing mm. and there would be a lot of like 
the work would always be celebrating the animal. Like I, yeah. I didn't want to do things that were shocking or grotesque. It was always making, uh, even if it had a wound in its neck with rubies pouring out, it was beautiful and it was done in reverence and in celebration. Um, but there was, you know, there have been times like I, I did a lot, I've done a lot of stillborn deer and I used to have an Italian greyhound and that, that actually I found quite confronting. And I, I always said I was going to do my dogs when they died and my first dog died last year and even before that happened I had kind of come to this point as they were getting older that I was like there's no way I want to be cutting my dog yeah. up like it's not it doesn't feel right and I, it's something that I probably wouldn't have had a problem with 10 years ago or something but I feel like the more I get and the more I come back into my body and come back into myself the harder I find that stuff so I think there was a level of being detached that made that easy for me Hmm. this might be a bit of a wacky question but do you think that you could ever taxidermy hypothetically taxidermy a human could you have the the has I mean the the separation between a human body and it just being a vessel and being actually honoring a, a human body yeah, it would be no different for me doing a human. I, again, if it was someone I knew, I couldn't right. do that. But there would, yeah, there would be no difference for me. Apart if it's illegal, uh, you have to have a medical license. But I've, you know, I've been to wet labs and stuff mm. like that before, and I find it fascinating. Um, I, I, you like you can't actually taxidermy a human in the way that you would taxidermy an animal anyway but yeah cutting a human body up would I would not have a problem with it it's funny because like my mum was a theatre nurse and she you know so all day she was in people's bodies and um seeing all sorts of kind of gory stuff but she can't watch any medical shows where they do operations like it makes her feel sick which Mm. I find really interesting it's like that sense of necessity and yeah Mm. Yeah, I also can't watch horrors. I can't watch it violence or anything like that. Anything that's alive being hurt, I find extremely disturbing. But when it's a dead body, I guess I have that real separation. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I was wondering whether uh, it doesn't sound like it, but whether you'd ever, you know, having your work being surrounded by. Um, you know, a- a- animals that have passed for so long. I was wondering whether you'd ever done any any work with with the dying, um, because uh, just just hearing like Ram Dass did a lot of work with the dying, and 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 Duncan Trussell, I think, also followed suit and went and spent a lot of time in hospices for um to just kind of uh, you know, there's one thing that they'll, that they'll say is uh m- most people do ninety nine percent of their spiritual work in the last um. Uh, few yeah, a few moments of life, and I was, I was just, I was just wondering, spending so much time around, around, uh, yeah, animals that have passed, and your spiritual work, whether that that was something that interests you. Yeah, I've actually had an eye cow for this year to look into that, but obviously it's not going to happen for mm. a while because of the pandemic. But Duncan is the one who kind of put that idea in my head, and it's interesting you say that because my my grandfather is. 97 and he's just gone into a home he has dementia he's miserable like he tries to escape from the home which he's actually had amazing or the last time he was he was in respite care for a while and he did manage to escape from there which was pretty incredible but he's just holding on so tight and I was actually I actually channeled him in my last mushroom session and just had this whole kind of epiphany because he was in a Japanese POW camp in the war and you know as a teenager and that would have been incredibly traumatic but there's no there was no like therapy back then like you just kind of came out and got on with your life and never processed that stuff and I just realized like the reason he can't die is because he's just holding on so tight and I had this dream last night that I was like holding his hand and just saying let go, Opera, it's okay, let go, let go. And, you know, it's difficult because he's in New Zealand and I can't even go there and my mum can't even go and see him at the moment because they're in lockdown too. But I just sent her a message and just said, is there a nurse there or someone who can just hold his hand? Like I just had this overwhelming feeling that he just needs someone there to, like, help him let go. And, yeah, I, I love that idea of being 
present for somebody going through that transition. And mm. I think you can learn a lot about yourself from that and a lot about life. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever, have you ever sat with someone while they died? Um, I mean, I sat with my grandparents while they were, I weren't, I wasn't there when they actually passed over, but yeah, I was, I was sitting with, you know, with my grandparents at separate times when they were not, um, you know, on their, on their way out. Um, yeah. I was pretty young. Um, I've, I've, I've kind of, um, Ram Dass and also like Shantaram, that book really, really got me interested in India. So I went over to, I've been to India like three times. And, um, one of the times I went to Varanasi where, you, you know, sit, and, and I spent a bit of time sitting at the burning ghats while there were just bodies yeah. one after the other being burnt right in front of you seeing, and yeah, it, it's, it's a really, that, that was a massive spin out being in like such a high energy, spiritual city kind of a uh, Varanasi, but, uh, and the attitude of death is so different over in, well, in India, uh, at least in Varanasi, I know there's like lots of different religions and, and everything over in India, so it's not just one thing. But um, you know, there's big parades in the street. You just be walking, and you might be ner- might be nursing a hangover or something, just normal day. And then you just hear this chanting, and then this body, like funeral procession, just like squeezes past you in these narrow streets. And then um, you know, not a, sorry to be graphic, but like you know, when when you're sitting by by burning bodies, like it's pretty, it's pretty full on. Like some of them get bloated, some of them like yeah. pop and liquid starts squirting sometimes like the face you see the face peel off the skull almost and you know it, it's it's pretty raw it's pretty brutal and it's um but it didn't seem like we're you're surrounded by this you don't have people wailing and crying um you know people weren't beside themselves it was it was just much more of an understanding in that context it was quite quite like nothing i'd ever experienced yeah well it's very like Western death is very clean and pretty and the embalming and, you know, all of that, the mortician's makeup and stuff, it's it's a very unhealthy way to process death, I think. And, you know, we're so it, it means when you are confronted with something like that, it's terrifying because it's all been packaged away in this kind of tidy way of, hiding it but I, you know I feel like it's just slow we've slowly got less and less in touch with death like you know in the middle ages people were there were bodies strewn across the streets with the plague and people were very comfortable with being around it and even the Victorians you know like they would they were cleaner with it but they would do the mortuary photography where they would like basically paint eyes on the eyelids of the person and prop them up and they would yeah. do it with babies and they would make more you know they would make morning jewelry using the hair of the deceased loved one and they would do inscriptions and all of the jet and memorial stuff and it was yeah like it was there was a beauty to it that was still accepting the darkness of it and now I just feel like it's it's all so perfect. Like I had a, a guy I went out with years ago whose mum died when he was like eight or nine and he wasn't allowed to go to the funeral because his dad thought it would fuck him up. Mm. And what fucked him up was not going to the funeral. And, you know, he was like in his late 30s when I was dating him and he still was having nightmares that she had just abandoned them. And, you know, it's like there's just not that. I feel like for me that getting to touch my grandmother, although it was traumatic, I think her dying regardless would have been traumatic, but mm. it just showed me, I think that's what started, you know, my understanding of it. There's more than just our body. Like you can't, that essence that was her is something other than what her body was after mm. she was dead. And yeah, it's, it's sad, I think, the way our culture hides hides it away. Especially like, oh god, now just during COVID and everything, um, I just can't. I'm just, I can't imagine 
losing someone and either not being able to attend their funeral or not even being able to go to their deathbed knowing they're dying or something, yeah. I just can't even entertain the thought. It's so it's so sad. It's so sad. I'm like, can everyone just every, can the whole world just hold on until this is all over? Because I just I can't I can't bear with you know. Imagine imagine that. Not well, even, Zoom funeral as well. Like I've, 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 I've done a Zoom funeral. Yeah. Yeah, it's meant yeah. to be awful, awful. Yeah. Um, what what do you what do you have plans for you, for what would happen to your vessel once once you've left the building? Yeah, I've had lots of plans over the years. Like, in all honesty, I don't really care, but I think mm. it's fun to kind of come up with ideas. And so, what was the first? I have I've got a work at Mona called the Cinerarium, which is a burial place. Mm -hmm. So David Walsh commissioned me to. Like basically I had free reign to do whatever I wanted. So I created this space that's got big black velvet curtains and like black flocked wallpaper and it's this black Victorian cabinet and it's got urns inside it. And so you can buy a plot in the museum and get buried in the in Mona. It's, they have like a lifetime death time membership. Mm. And um, a part of my that's contract awesome. is that I, I have a free burial there if I choose. Mm -hmm. um, what were the other things? There's the Life Gem Company and another one I've forgotten the name of that take the ashes of a deceased person and they can compress it into a, a real diamond, like it's man-made, but it's a chemically real diamond. That's pretty awesome. That's awesome. So I like that. that <laughs> my dog decide I'm going to get her turned into a little diamond and make a ring and my mum, when she dies, will get her turned into a couple of one-carat diamonds and my sister and I will have a ring each Um there was something else. Oh, I'm also a donor. For, I don't know if you're familiar with the Institute for Plastination. No. Gunter von Hagen. You know those Body Worlds exhibitions? Oh, right. Yep. Yeah, Gunter von Hagen. So I, when I first – I saw a thing on the news probably almost 20 years ago where he was in trouble for getting bodies from somewhere that wasn't necessarily legit. And I was like, oh, he needs more bodies. <laughs> I became a donor. And – I quite like the idea of that because I feel like it's only fitting if I'm doing taxidermy that something similar should happen to me. And they send you the most hilarious questionnaires mm -hmm. about what you are and are not willing to have done. And I just said yes to everything because, again, like I feel like my animals don't get a say in what's done to them. So, um, but I, yeah, I would, if it was possible, I would probably like to be half of me plastinated and then half in my Mona. Yeah. Cabinet. Yeah, awesome. I've seen there's like a TED talk with the mushroom suit. Have you seen that one? This like yeah, ladies, I like that. Idea that looks too. awesome. I, I like the idea yeah. of like becoming a tree somehow, just like stuffing my body with fertilizer and then just putting a seed on top. That that sounds yeah. pretty awesome. There's this um, a friend of mine called Georgia Banks. Um, I chatted to her on the on the podcast. She actually um for an art piece um, basically did is is doing a competition where. Uh, it's this weird questionnaire that's kind of very similar to the questionnaire that you'd receive for a beauty pageant. And basically the winner will um, get total legal rights over her her funeral and what to do with her body. It's just completely giving it all to a stranger, which is just like, <laughs> it's so crazy. <laughs> but yeah. When yeah. I was little, I used to say to mum, which was like now looking back, it was a really mean thing to say, but I thought it was funny at the time. But I used to say to her that if I if I died of a horrific car accident or something, I wanted an open casket funeral. <laughs> 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 Without any remediation works to be done. Just and go out full like heavy now, metal. Yeah, she used to get really upset and now I kind of see why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um you're um, kind of just like with your work. You're you're quite a bit of an animal rights activist, aren't you? Are you um, are you still like a vegan? You said you're vegetarian. Were you a vegan for a while? Yeah, no, I was vegan. Like, I went, so I was. I became vegetarian when I was twelve. I had a few periods of anemia where I wasn't. Became very strict vegetarian in my early twenties. Then, yeah, I think late twenties became vegan. Then fruitarian. What's um, fruitarian? Is that when things have to fall naturally, or just fruit? Just so fruit. Fruit, and then like, 
leafy greens and stuff. It's mental. Like it's, um, you think that you feel really good, but you're just off your face on sugar and no protein. Right. <laughs> um, but it was it kind of came about from when I was going through health stuff as a result of burnout that my digestion was had just shut down so much that it was you know like it, fruit was working for me for a while um but I think that then caused some more knock-on problems and now I'm not even vegetarian um because of this health stuff but I'm like the stuff that I do eat is like I make bone broth out of like lamb bones and stuff so I'm kind of using things that are more of a byproduct instead of buying right. things main cuts and I eat you know, like organic free range eggs. I'm going to get my own chooks nice. here. Um, but that was very confronting. You know, I basically a few years ago realized that I had to start doing that. And after having built my whole, not built my career on it, but, you know, my work very linked. To, and I still believe in animal rights. Like I think factory farming is horrific. I think the overconsumption of meat is horrific. Mm. And I think wastefulness and the poor treatment of animals and everything. But, it, yeah, it's interesting to kind of have been so dogmatic one at one point and then having to come into a different way. Again, it's, you know, you just learn that there's, there's no such thing as right in anything. Mm. And I was, you know, the, the vegan community is a terrifying community. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was so scared that like, when it first when I first started doing this because I, I I was being attacked when I was vegan, you know, I was getting death threats and stuff really? like that. Death threats. Like, yeah, yeah. When I the giraffe piece got picked up by an animal rights group who posted it and said that I'd killed the giraffe for the work and they had a huge following and then that all of the people that followed them started reposting it and I couldn't go on Instagram for about a month Holy and shit. every like every post I had had like hundreds of people just saying the most awful stuff and I was getting DMs from people saying we know where you love, live we're, we're going to come and get you we're going to turn you into a stool a footstool like just I was just like yes compa- the compassionate yeah where's the <laughs> we hate okay. killing but we will kill you Death threats. Um, <laughs> no wonder you had a burnout. Like for God's sake. I mean, yeah, I guess that's like goes with the nature of your work. It's such kind of, um, you know, it, it's such high energy work. I guess it's so like I was saying at the polarizing. start, polarizing. Yeah. But it does. It commands so much presence. You know, it, it really does. And it, it's it's that I think that combination between well, initially seeing death but also the the combined aesthetics that you put it with and actually make them look really beautiful and i totally agree with you you, you it's it's honoring um it's honoring the animal and i mean that's that's how i always viewed like collecting skulls and stuff i'm like this is like a beautiful object that a sculptor could probably not even make it's so perfect yeah, it's and, sacred. It's, yeah, yeah totally totally i do i do see it as like sacred but to receive all that is hor- horrible. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, well, and, it, you know, like for me, my work was never about turning people vegan or vegetarian. It was all I've ever wanted is people to just make informed decisions because so mm. much information is hidden from us. And so, like, an example of this would be, like, I did a piece called Neapolitan and it was like an antique ice cream scoop and it had three little chicks sitting in it and I dyed one pink, one was the natural yellow color and the other one was dyed brown and you know like it's a cute piece and it's funny and people laugh at it and then they ask about it and the meaning behind it was that you know like these days everyone wants to buy free range eggs they want to know like everyone knows how horrible battery farming is and nobody wants to participate in that so people actively search out free range eggs but then there's products like ice cream and wine and stuff that use eggs and they use factory farmed eggs and you just don't even think about it because it's like it's not they don't have to list it on the label and so that would be something that you know obviously it's a good talking point because someone would ask what it means and I would do a lot of interviews on tv and stuff and get to talk about that and I would just get so many emails from people saying oh my god like I've always 
thought I was making ethical decisions in my whole life. I've been buying this ice cream with this product in it that I'm completely against. And that was really what the work was about, was like giving people information and getting people to objectively look at the decisions they were making so they can make the decisions that are aligned with them morally instead of just blindly consuming products where the companies that are making them are hiding what they're doing. Mm. And yeah, that's, that's what I really have a problem with is like people consuming stuff that they don't agree with without knowing it. Hypocrisies, societal, yeah. societal hypocrisies, I guess. Yeah. How do you yeah. feel about hunting? Um, I am not into hunting in terms of doing it for a trophy I think hunting in terms of using a whole animal is far better than factory farming or even traditional farming. Like, mm. you know, the animal is out in the wild. It is a, generally a much less cruel and terrifying death because it's sudden. Um, yeah, like I've changed. I was very against anything, you know, like I was a very dogmatic vegan at one point where I just didn't think it was right to kill anything. But I've now... You know, you start to realise stuff as you open your mind up and, you know, in terms of the environment, regenerative farming is pretty much one of the most important things that we yeah. need to do and that involves ruminants and, um, yeah, I think there's a balance. There is a balance to life and I just think if we're going to take life, it needs to be done in a more humane and delicate way and we've got to stop you know, chucking animals in cages and doing all of that. But, yeah, I have I admire people who hunt in that way where they do it with a reverence for the animal and they use the whole animal. And, mm. yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't personally kill something, which is, you know, one of the reasons I was vegetarian. Like when I went, I had an experience on a farm when I was a kid, which is what woke me up to that. And I still feel challenged even consuming animal products but i can see it from a different light now as right well. i think that's a, i mean that's the thing right i mean we, we we always want to simplify things and just make it as simple as possible but um i like i i've got a lot of respect for for veganism i think if you're willing to like sacrifice all the delicious foods that you previously enjoyed because you recognize that you know if you you know if you can avoid killing and you you know, I, I think that's awesome. And if you can do it in a really healthy way, that's fantastic. I also really admire hunters for taking on taking the blood on their hands in in a way, making it a quick a quick death using the um yeah the whole animal um it's uh yeah it's it's not a black and white thing really like there is and and I wish the I really wish um you know so many vegan uh people could uh approach it. I guess without the tunnel vision lens, because I really actually ag agree with the movement. I think it's awesome. And I'm really not trying to shit on vegans right now. Cause I, I, I respect it, but, um, you know, like you said, there, there, there's a, there's a fero ferocity, there's a ferocious yeah. nature about, uh, you know, um, which I'm sure you, so you, you received with the, with your work. I, f I feel like there's, there's two, kind of branches I think there are people who are truly coming from a place of compassion and then there's another group of people who just want something to be angry about and mm. and I think you know it's it works for some people health-wise and it doesn't work for others and I think that compassion also needs to extend to yourself and I think there is an element of punishing yourself sometimes by doing that and that's not ahimsa and that's not compassion you know like there are there are ways to do things that are kind to yourself that are also kind to the environment and animals and yeah it's finding it's just finding that balance I guess and I've always been a very extreme person so that's where I'm what I'm working on now is maybe not being so extreme and trying to bring balance it's hard my... it's hard you know <laughs> sometimes <laughs> we all want something to believe in too you know um, so what, what are you, um, you're taking a big hiatus from the taxidermy. So are you immersing yourself in jewelry at the moment? Yeah. So the jewelry is just always there. Like that's yeah. kind of my, my foot, my other full-time job. They're both full-time jobs, which is also <laughs> the reason I'm not doing yeah. the taxidermy 
is, is helpful. Um, but yeah, like I'm, my favorite thing is doing wedding and engagement rings. I love making, I love working with precious gems. I love the sentiment and the fact that you're making things that are potentially going to be passed down through generations. I love making things for people that they love so much. You know, there's all these stories and it's not just wedding engagement rings. I do funerary rings, memorial rings. I've done divorce rings, you know, like there's kind of all of these moments that can be celebrated through jewellery and the symbolism in it. Um, And then there's other kind of ideas percolating, like, I'm quite interested. My last exhibition, I started working with VR and that sort of thing. And basically I had the whole exhibition was 3D scans. So um, I can even give you a link to that for the, if you have show notes or anything. Yeah, yeah, please. But I am, and it works with, you know, like if you use a Google, one of those Google cardboard VR headsets, like you can actually like walk around the exhibition um but I did want to take it further but it just it blew out so much in terms of work and budget and everything already where it was but I really would like to do some proper like VR work um so cool creating like a world and creating different experiences around death and um I was also looking into augmented reality at the time as well but that seemed to be that's actually more difficult than VR I think um, and more expensive to do and I'm also interested in working with AI as well like I've got a few ideas with that but I just I don't know anyone that works with AI like I started trying to find people for that show because I wanted to do some algorithms around death but um, again it was just like I had to start focusing and that is all just yeah it's kind of there sitting in the back of my mind for when I feel ready to start producing work again cannot yeah. wait to see what you come up with are you you're you're a podcast listener do you ever listen to lex friedman yes yes actually love, that, love yeah. lex love lex <laughs> it's uh, the last time i listened to him it's funny i don't even oh yeah i was listening to him with um matthew walker the sleep guy right i haven't and listened to that one yet it's, a, it's really lovely it's a really good episode um but that gave me some really interesting AI ideas that I want to play with. And I was actually think I it's probably one of those impossible things, but I was thinking of like reaching out to Lex to see if he would collaborate. You know, you just there's no harm I'm oh trying. God, that would be amazing. Uh, Julia yeah, Deville and Lex Friedman collab. Holy shit. I yeah, I won't say what the idea is yet, sure. but it's um yeah, I think it could be a pretty cool one. Or even, you know, like just find somebody who's really good with AI. Yeah. It'd be an exciting collaboration, I think. Hey, I tell you, the power of an email. I never, ever, ever thought I would get half the people I've gotten on this podcast, but some people yeah. just respond. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's, it's amazing who you can kind of get on the other, how accessible people are these days. Yeah. that I mean, you know, as much as like social media can really fuck people's mental health up and just I'm totally addicted, but... Yeah, if you if you can get on top of the addictive part of it, it it can actually be such an incredible tool, such an incredible like people are accessible. Never never before has that been the case. It's it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, mm. definitely. Yeah, I feel like I've kind of finally learned how to work with social media. Like I don't really look at it mm. anymore. I just use it as a tool, but it, that took a lot of discipline to get to that. Yeah, to that place because. Yeah, I was addicted to it too, especially Instagram for me as a visual person. Yep, it's yep. Down the rabbit hole. It's my Achilles heel. <laughs> <laughs> um, Julia, thank you so, so much for being so open and, and everything. This is, I've really enjoyed this, this chat. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's been great. Um, really, really interesting stuff. Your practice is beautiful. Uh, absolutely fascinating your story is fascinating um yeah i can't wait to see i can't wait to see some uh, i don't know <laughs> i don't know what's going to happen in the future with your ai collab but it sounds very very exciting no thank you so much this was really fun it's nice to not just talk about art 
for once. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I've, I mean, I've gone through a few of your a fair few of your interviews in the last few days, and all my questions were like almost exactly how everyone else's questions were. So I was like, shit, got to mix this up. Yeah, there's definitely um, a formula. It's, it's hard to not sound like a robot sometimes. Totally. But they're, you know, like they're, they're very obvious questions. Like they're the first questions that anybody that encounters my work wants to know. So they're kind of important. Mm, yeah. Well, if anyone wants to know about the giraffe and, and all that, pretty much just go on any other interview Julia's done on YouTube you'll get the answer to all those questions <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it and by the way i love your sign off on your um your email you just said interdimensionally julia yes. Deville. fantastic <laughs> well thank you so much <laughs> thanks for listening everyone take it take care oh oh hold on um how does everyone find you Oh, I'm just Julia Deville on Instagram and then Julia Deville Bridal for um, more just wedding jewellery stuff and yeah, Julia Deville on Facebook. Um, if you just Google my name, it will come up. Nice one. Fantastic. Well, thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Take care.